Uh, I'll see the email, Peyton, quick, and let her know that. I see the art here. All right, so what I'd like you guys to do is have out your uh, periodic table note sheet and the blank periodic table. If you don't have those, they're located right next to Kenny, uh, and you can get those out next to you, okay? Mm -hmm. Yep, and then underneath that, they're probably stacked, there's a uh, blank periodic table underneath it. is just talk about uh, the organization of the periodic table while you guys are finishing up eating your donuts. And then we're going to go through five different groups of elements on the periodic table. We'll talk about what group number or numbers they belong to and what characteristics they have. And there's one other section on the back that says uh, trends, and we'll do that another day. The rest of the class period, you're just going to color your periodic, uh, your blank periodic table with these five groups that we're going to talk about. So uh, just some side facts before we uh, get going here. The 97% uh, of living organisms are made out of just these, um, or of a living organism, 90% of their body is made out of just these elements. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphorus, and sulfur. There are trace elements of other um, metals and uh, non-metals, and uh, we get those from uh, primarily eating like fruits and vegetables or other organisms. So we didn't know all the elements at once. So here we have a periodic table and it has all the elements that we knew about at the time this was made, okay? And they're all organized and the, the periodic table has its own unique shape. That wasn't always the case. And so scientists had to do lots of problem solving to figure out how to um, organize all these elements that we have or that they had discovered at the time. And so, um, <clears throat> One method that led to the creation or the organization of the periodic table that it uh, is in today is by taking all the elements and organizing them, placing them in order of increasing mass. And when they did that, they found that there was a pattern that every eight elements, those elements had similar chemical or physical properties. So for instance, if we look at lithium here, lithium is an element that is highly reactive in water. We go eight elements down as we had placed them the elements in order, and we found that that element, sodium, was also really reactive in water. If we look at another group here, so like fluorine, fluorine was a highly reactive gas. We go eight elements down, find chlorine, also a highly reactive gas. So discovering this trend led scientists to then place the elements that had similar chemical properties into the same column or group on the periodic table. So you'll see on your, on your blank periodic table that sodium is right below lithium, right? And so uh, as elements were discovered, they kept applying this pattern and using that to organize uh, the elements on the periodic table. So the elements on the periodic table are organized in two different ways. 
or there's groups. So elements in the same group have similar chemical properties. And those are columns on the periodic table. And then there are periods which are rows on the periodic table. Other ways that elements are classified is by the type of element. So we can organize elements by either being a metal, metalloid, or non-metal. These are broad categories. We can see that the majority of elements are metals. Some are non-metals. And then in between the metals and non-metals are the metalloids. On your note sheet, what I'd like you guys to do is outline where metals, non-metals, and metalloids are. It doesn't have to be specific like this. You can just do it in general. So if you just like circle this area, exclude hydrogen, and then strike metals, this region here, and write metalloids, and this region here, and write non-metals, that'll, that'll do. So for this grade level right now, you just need to know the general location of where they're at. Then I could offer you bubble gum. I got bubble gum. Okay. Double bubble. All right. So group columns on the periodic table are called groups. Rows are called periods. Elements in the same group have similar chemical properties. And we're going to talk about um, specifically four uh, distinct groups that have four very distinct sets of properties. Before we talk about those groups, let's uh, talk about metalloids. So metalloids are in between the groups of um, or the section of the metals and the non-metals on the periodic table. So we have metals and non-metals. And based off their location, they have properties of both metals and non-metals. Oral silicate glass, for instance, is, is something in our classroom that contains metalloids. So it's just regular glass, so like silicon dioxide, that also has a boron in it. Okay? Great, can you close your computer? So it also has boron in it. And by putting that boron in there, it allows uh, the glass to be more durable to extreme temperature changes. So if we were to use like mason jars or just like glasses in water glasses to do stuff in chemistry, that glass would shatter pretty easily whenever we heated it up or uh, set it on a cold surface after heating it up. And so um, by having the boron in here, it allows the glassware to uh, be less affected by any uh, sharp changes in temperature. But it still is, uh, still can break if we take something that's really hot and set it on a cool surface. But it's much more durable than a regular glassware. All right. Um, yeah. All right. So this is the first group that we're going to talk about. So see on your note sheet where it says alkali metals. Okay. Alkali metals are in the group one, so the first group on the periodic table. So this is on your note sheet now. All right, group number one. Okay, and then these are the properties. So besides hydrogen, hydrogen's a non-metal, but all the other elements below it are the alkali metals. Are highly reactive in water. And 
because they're so highly reactive in water and our the air that we breathe in our atmosphere contains water, these elements don't exist in their normal elemental form in nature because they're reactive. So we only find these elements as part of a compound, something where they can be more stable. If we were to draw the Bohr models of all these elements, we would see that they have one valence electron, or one electron on their outer <coughs> ring. It's this property about their structure that makes them highly reactive. One of the topics we're going to learn about is chemical bonding. And so atoms can bond by doing one of three things with their electrons. So they can gain an electron, they can lose an electron, or they can share electrons, okay? That's the way that they can interact. No matter what method they choose, they behave the way that they do so that they can become more stable and atoms become more stable by having a full shell. So if you remember with drawing Bohr models, what was the maximum number of electrons that could fit on the first ring? Two. So if you had, if your outer shell was the just the first energy level, it would only need two electrons to be full, and that atom or ion would be considered to be stable. So if lithium finds a way to lose this one electron, it has a full shell, even though it's just two electrons, right? All other energy levels are considered full when they have eight. So we can see if sodium loses this one electron, then it has eight electrons left on its second ring. And so atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons, depending on what the other atom is, to do this, to get a full shell. Now, sodium could get a full shell by gaining seven, too, but you can imagine that it would take a lot more energy to go get seven electrons and try to get them to stick onto the sodium to get a full shell. And it would be a lot easier just to get rid of one. Okay? And so it's because there's just one electron here uh, that makes all these elements so reactive. The more reactive something is, it's the less energy for it to um, lose or, or gain its electron. So chemical reactions work kind of like how water flows. It finds the lowest point or the lowest, follows the path of the lowest energy. So we have a little video here. Sodium. Symbol NA. 11 protons. Let me make sure I'm sharing the screen. Electrons and electrons. 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 Arranged Arrange shells is, is 2, 8, 8, and 1. And one. Sodium, Sodium is an alkaline metal. metal. Like, like all the all elements in this group, group, it's desperate, desperate to get rid of that, of that extra, extra electron. electron. Well, you cut it you quickly. Cut quickly. I should I see some silver and silver Indeed. Wow. It slices like cheese, but it's actually a soft metal. Teo's always put on one of his favorite sodium demonstrations. What happens when the pure element dumps its outer electron in a violent altercation with ordinary water? He insists we wait until nightfall when the reaction will be most spectacular. Kids, do not try this at all. The whole purpose of this contraption is just to dump it into a bucket of water. This is a sodium dumping machine. All right, let's give this a try. Here we go. What we're what seeing we're is seeing what happens when sodium's, sodium's extra, extra electron airs apart water, water molecules, molecules, releasing flammable hydrogen gas, gas, the H2O, which explodes, which explodes when it mixes with, with air. air. The next, the next day, day, Teo takes it up enough, as, as if sodium plus water, water are violent, violent enough. enough. Now he wants to combine, combine the same deadly, deadly sodium, sodium with another, with another element, element, chlorine, chlorine, one of the halogens. 
The result, the result claim will, claim will be, be a tasty, tasty flavoring flavor that will Isn't chlorine isn't deadly, deadly poison? poison? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, chlorine and chlorine, 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 chlorine,
such an energetic reaction. It doesn't take a lot of energy for these metals to lose their electrons. And um, there's a big change in energy when these ones get the electrons. So these ones really want the electrons, and these ones really want to give up the electrons. And so they uh, are highly reactive with one another. Does anyone know the name of the long time heat? What's a property of the lack of the last column that we're going to talk about? Group 18 mobile gases. No property about them. So noble gases are the most unreactive group. So they are unreactive. Rarely part of compounds. To get them to be in a compound, you have to use lots of energy to kind of force the atoms together. And they're unreactive because they have the full shell. They have what all other atoms want. So they're content. They, they, they don't desire to gain or lose or share any electrons. They have all the electrons they need. And we count, we look at these four models here. Every outer ring has a uh, full shell. The last group we're going to talk about is more like a section of the periodic table, and it's where the transition metals are. So the transition metals kind of make up the valley or the low point of the periodic table, the midsection. The transition metals are what we traditionally think of when we think of metals. So um, the alkali and alkaline earth metals are really those reactive groups of metals are pretty soft in that you could use like a butter knife to cut them or like uh, calcium here I could use like a scissors and, and cut them cut up chunks of the calcium and so transition metals are what we think of with metals we can see we have zinc and copper and nickel silver and gold uh, iron and so metals have high melting points takes a lot of energy to melt them. They're very conductive of heat and electricity. And one thing that's going to come up when we talk about chemical bonding is that the, the transition metals are unique in that they can form different types of ions. So a single element can have can form different types of ions. So like iron, for instance, can form like a plus one, plus two, or plus three ion. Where when we come back to this, we'll see that all the elements in group one form a plus one ion. All the elements in group two form a plus two ion. But the metals here in the middle have some variability. We could form multiple ions. <clears throat> all right, so we're not going to cover the uh, trends today. We'll come back to that. Yep, can you? For the transition, do we put just group 3 through 12? You bet. Yep, groups 3 through 12. So uh, all we're doing the rest of class is you're going to grab color pencils here, and I'm going to put it up on the board for people at home to see. But what I want you to do is uh, color the periodic table by just those five groups. So you want to cover color the, you can color them whatever you want. It doesn't have to match here. I want you to color the alkali metals, the alkaline earth, the transition metals, the halogens, and the noble gases. And just like there's a key on here for those groups, you're going to make a color-coded key on your periodic table. Okay? So if you, you would pause this. Yes, I'm going to stop recording here. Uh, you don't. You guys can go ahead and